morning, everyone. Good morning. It is awesome to be here today, and just so glad to see everyone. And uh, let's see, we'll kind of, today's gonna we kind of got some weird weather going on over the next week. So um, I think uh, you get to be joyful one more week. All that, and it, everybody already heard. Well, it's supposed to rain. Well, that's what spring is all about. So if you want to be in a spring mood, that's warmth and rain. That's what you're gonna have next week. Warmth and rain. So, uh, so it's a good day. It's a good day to be here in the house of the Lord. It's a good day to, um, I think the weather is beautiful outside. So does anybody have any announcements to share before I share? Anyone? Um, if you didn't get a chance to get one, um, uh, Ann was going to put the address um, to reach out to Max if you wanted to send a Christmas card. And so um, there are little... Um, labels back there on the table and it has his address on it where he's at the room number all that kind of stuff so you can take that and you can stick it right on the envelope and uh if you want to send him a christmas card or something because mac will probably be at regency for um i would think at least uh four weeks and uh so if you'd like to send a christmas card or just a note or something telling you're thinking of him um, please do that and uh, they are on the table there in the back so you can uh, just stick that on the envelope and uh, I did go up and see him on Wednesday and uh, um, Mac is doing pretty good I mean he's always talking about how he's walking and I asked him I said hey, you want to go for a walk and he said yes and so we got up and he took off and I said am I going to get in trouble for this no I don't think so and so we headed down and got to the first corner and the nurse was there and said I don't think you're supposed to be out walking the hall with your guests and Mac you know you're supposed to have a mask on when you come out of your room and so we did get in a little trouble and uh but I did talk to the nurse and she said I said is it okay if we take the long way back and continue around the, the walk and and she said I didn't see nothing, so. And, uh, but he did really good. Uh, he's getting around really well. He's eating really good and uh, gaining strength. So, um, so just continue to uh, pray for Mac and, and his recovery. And of course, he's still um, kind of down the loss of Teresa and, and kind of putting that to a, you know, uh, the memorial service. He mentioned that a couple of times, and I said, Mac, until you're out of here and you can come, we're not doing the memorial. So, um, so just continue to pray for him, and a lot of good things happening with Mac. So, um, let's see. Also, we have an anniversary this week on Tuesday. Jim and Sharon both have an anniversary. Uh, spoke with Sharon um, this week, and uh, her infection is still um, there. And uh, so they're kind of struggling with that, and she's still having some pain from the hip surgery. So we need to continue to pray for uh, Jim and Sharon. Uh, also today, after uh, after I get done with Nyman, so around 12 o'clock, we're going to have a mission meeting here at the church. And uh, so if you can come back for that, we're going to kind of go over some things that we want to use our mission money with and, and disperse that. Um, also, the uh, Feed the Pig this, uh, this uh, month is uh, the milk money for a sorrowful mother, and so we're taking that and, uh, and putting that together, so hopefully we are able to reach our goal of uh, um, providing milk for one month, like we've been doing the last few years, and uh, so um, be in prayer for that and uh, give generously. Um, the last number I heard from talking to some of the ladies that are working over there is still reaching out into the hundred plus a week um, in the family. So providing that milk uh, for the kids is, is pretty important. Um, let's see, I think, oh, I also put this in my hand, the upper rooms, the new ones are in. If you would like one of those, January, February, uh, they're down there in the narthex or some on the table right there. So you can grab those. And so let's say happy anniversary to Jim and Sharon first. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, dear friends. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, Jim and Sharon. I do need readers for next week's Advent. And uh, we need a couple of readers for next week's Advent reading. Um, Dave and Mary are going to do it um, this week. And today is uh, the day that we think uh, of joy. So we'd like the... Uh, pink candle today and uh so pretty exciting there and 
I was trying to think. I think there's something else, but as always, when it pops in my head, I'll relate to all of you. So whenever that happens, we'll see what happens. Well, Dick Rosado is still with the company. What's that? Dick Rosado is still with the company. Oh, and Dick is uh, still, as far as I know, in St. Anthony. I went up and visited him uh, Sunday. Um, he told me, what are you doing up here? And uh, by the time I had visited for a while, he said, you know, he said, I really appreciate your visit and this air. I'm glad you came and all that, but go home and do something, you know. <laughs> and uh, Pat said, don't worry about that. He tells everybody that. And I said, I've been dealing with Mac for a while, so he, he doesn't bother me at all. So it's, uh, it's all good. So um, I told him he just looked like an old Studebaker sitting there in that bed, and they got him all hooked up to tubes and wires trying to diagnose what's going on. Um, but, as an update for that, is uh, they did do open heart, and uh, he did a, got a double bypass. That's what, uh, um, he was uh, um, sitting on the edge of bed, and all of a sudden just got hit with the heaviness. Fortunately, the fireman across the street came over, they called the ambulance, Dick said he's not going to the hospital, paramedic said, Dick, you're going. And so they took him and very fortunate for that because he did get a double bypass. And um, there was a third blockage, but it wasn't um, needed to do a bypass. So um, Dick was doing well when I saw him. So um, please continue to pray for Pat and Dick and all the family as, as he continues to, to get better. So um, I think that's all. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go to the call. Father God, today is Sunday, the day of joy, the third Sunday of Advent. We come before you, Father, standing here in awe of our God. And we are so full of joy today. We've been looking at hope and peace, and today is, is, is about joy. And Father, I just pray that we can learn so much from this passage today, um, that we can take that joy out into the world. Father, serving you and, and, and having you as our, our Savior and our God, is something to be joyful about. And so, Father, in the midst of all our darkness, in the midst of all our troubles, in the midst of all these things happening in the world today, Father, we come before you lifting up our God and singing praises to his name. But, Father, we're going to look at something different today, and it's how God, how God is singing his praises to us. And so, Father, we thank you for this time together. May our hearts and minds be opened up to the glory of your word. In all that we do today, Father, may we glorify you. May we bring the message of Christ to the world and the people in which we see. Father, our hearts are filled with joy today as we come before you and we are able to worship with you here in the sanctuary or whether we join online. It doesn't matter. We are all one in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all join together in the call to worship. <clears throat> A path to our God, weaving through the busyness, overcoming roadblocks and detours, a way to go home, leaving the past and the past, moving from darkness and exile, Advent is a path to our God, a way to come home, a discovery of God's voice, rejoice, rejoice. God is with us. Let us sing our first hymn, 230, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
seated. <clears throat> Today's question uh, that was given um, by somebody is going to be a two-part question, meaning not going to answer both parts this week, but one part will be this week and the next part is uh, basically two different questions. And so the first question that I want to um, I will give to you is this. What happened to the Native American Indians before they were introduced to Christ? And so I thought this question, that's the first question. Next week you'll find out the other one. If, you, if your anticipation is growing, you just have to be here next week to, to hear it. I'm not even going to give you the question this week. So, But I found this kind of interesting in a sense that it made me kind of think about this. And, and I even ordered a book and to read about uh, Christianity and the Native American Indians and, and how it works. And, and when I got it, when I came in the mail, it's like this thick, and I was not expecting that. I should have looked at all the pages, you know, see how much was in there. So it's going to take a lot more research to, to say this because it, I, I feel that I am not an authority on this subject. And uh, I, if, uh, if, uh, um, <clears throat> if uh, Julie Stahlbaum was still with this way, I would have surely reached out to her, and I still probably will. Uh, for some help, but I did uh, learn an awful lot about this, and so um, I want you to just kind of think about um, this in, in a sense, is that basically the, the, the religion and the spirituality of the Native American Indian, and that's how we're going to kind of address it in the beginning. So just kind of recap the question, what happened to the Native American Indians before they were introduced to Christ? And first of all, we have to look at what you know, what I learned, and, and I'm not, I, I truly believe that Native American Indians are one of the most spiritual um, people that, you know, are around. And, and whatever you agree or disagree about their spirituality, I just think there is no other group, at least in my mind, that I'm familiar with, that, it, you know, is, uh, believes in taking care of, of God's creation and, and uh, the, uh, the world and and uh, everything is a blessing from God, and in their words, a great creator. And so taking care of the earth and the water and the, and the animals and all that, I just feel that there's nobody more spiritual than they are in that sense. But what I learned about some of this is the Native American uh, religions is they were generally inclusive. Inclusivists is what they call them. And they, in other words, they were open to... Um, other religions. They were open to the, the, the stories. They were open to the visions. They were open to the experiences. They were open to all of these things, and they were open to accept that and, and in, their, in, in their hearing that. In other words, I think when, in the book that I was reading, there was like, there was like 500 and some different tribes in America when, when Columbus came over. That's kind of where this book starts in 1492 and there was, so there was over 500 different tribes here in america when columbus came over and so i kind of think about this because they were inclusivists because of the fact that they had their religion within their tribe and so i sit there and think about how that they, they just kind of adapted their spirituality around what they believed or what they experienced in their and their specific tribe and so they had their um, own beliefs but they were open to the beliefs of others because when they would come in contact with another tribe who might have a little bit different way of believing that, but they still accepted that. And they were open to hear it and they were open to, to listen to each other. And so there were some questions that came up that I, that I kind of uh, read and kind of thought were important for us to look at. And said one question was, can Indians accept Christianity without giving up their own beliefs. Now they're very spiritual and they're also very strong in their culture. And so their belief is very um, culture based or what they, their beliefs are about. But many Indians, were, it was very possible for them to accept Christianity because of the fact that they were open to listening to other people tell their stories or their visions or about their religion. So they were open to other people. And so they were open to Christianity because to them, there was multiple different ways to believe. There was other tribes that believed. And so when the Christians came in to America and began to teach of Christianity, they were open to listening to them. So um, this question, of they, they were open to receiving that 
and still not give up their belief, their culture. And so uh, another question was, what do the religious religions of the Indi indigenous American Indians and Christianity have in common? Now, I thought this was really important here for um, in believing that the Indians could accept Christianity. And so in there it says both the American religions and the Christianity have the same goal. And that goal is that they to bring the individual, in other words, you and I and, and the, their tribe, the people of their tribe, they were uh, the, the goal was to bring the individual into harmony with the eternal truth. And so when we sit there and think about that, that they were open to the eternal truth, in other words, wherever that was, and then, well, I'm going to tell you where that is now, but as we are to that of Christ. So they, we are open, and, and our, our goal is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They had that same individual relationship with their, um, their uh, great creator, is what they call it. So the other is not only in that, but we have a God, the only God, and they have the great creator. So the two common things about both religions is that we can have a relationship with our God and the, the, that truth that comes from God, but also that we can have that with our God, who is Jesus Christ, and also they have a relationship with God, the great creator. And so... Now, I said, God, theirs is to say the great creator. But one of the struggles that was especially for the missionaries, in 1492, Columbus came over, and I'm not going to get into all the history and the, and the hate and all that that was going on, but it was later, years later, um, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it was 1498 or something like that, that the missionaries came over to, to teach Christianity. They were very involved in coming. But one of the struggles of the missionaries was this, is that the struggle of the missionary was the multitude of different denominations. And so there was meaning that I just told you that kind of could be every tribe, every other tribe, all that, that they believed in different religions. And it, and it was based on their culture. It was based on their tribe. And so they believed in all these different um, um, religions that could be possible. And so the missionaries struggled with that because the missionaries believed there was one God. And so I found this, this quote that was by a Seneca chief that said this, and this, this could be seen as the struggle of the American Indian with the teaching of the missionaries. And this, this Seneca chief said this, if there is but one religion, why do you white people differ so much? And I kind of thought that was really important is if there is one religion, why do you white people struggle so much um, about that religion? And so I kind of began to think about that, about the struggles that we still have today. We still struggle with that. But my question is this, and I, I, I've said every week that this kind of has opened up a door to a Bible study because there's so much more to what we could discuss in, in this than just this little section here. So I'm going to say this, as we, remember, we must remember that not everyone connects with God in the same way. Now I've said this over and over, the Bible speaks to us wherever we are. We can read the, we're going to read Zephaniah today, and I'm going to read you, and I'm going to tell you what it meant for the people um, of that day, what, their, what Zephaniah was talking about, and then I'm going to tell you what we believe as Christians that it's telling us. The Bible speaks to us in different ways. It speaks to us where we are. And so in that, you must remember that not everyone connects with God in the same way. But I'm going to throw this out to you. Nor does God connect with everyone in the same way. And I think that's important. Because God may speak to you in one way and connect with you, but he speaks to me in another way. And I think that comes from the Old Testament I think we can have an example of that in the Old Testament reading with Zephaniah that we have today. What God was doing in that time period and what God is telling us today is two different ways. So God connects with us in different ways. And we can't expect everyone to, to connect in God in the same way. Missionaries came over to America a few years after Columbus' arrival. I said about, four, I think it was 1498, if I remember right. 
And so I'm, I'm going to throw out this question from this person's question. Is this. Who's to say that God was not there already? Who's to say that God wasn't at work within the tribes of the Native American Indians long before the missionaries came over? God connects with people in different ways. And I'm going to throw you a curveball to think about. There are 198 different names and titles for Jesus in the Bible today. 198 different names or titles for Jesus today. That's in the Bible. In this time, when they, in 1492, there was no written Bible. There was no written word. This was a spiritual uh, life that the Native American Indians. So who is to say this great creator was not God himself? Who is to say this longing for a relationship with the great creator was not a part of Jesus himself, another name for Jesus Christ? Who is to say that that's what was happening there? So my question for all of us is to think about this. There are 20 plus, I couldn't remember exactly, I counted them one um, Easter uh, Sunday in the paper when they, when they come up and every, all the churches in the community get to put an ad in the paper. You know, there are 20 plus, I can't remember, 22, 27, whatever it is. In this community alone, there are 20 plus different churches, different beliefs, but all come together in one thing. I'm talking about Christian churches. And all of them come together and have one thing, that there is a relationship with our God through Jesus Christ. And there is but one faith in God himself. So who's to say that God wasn't at work long before the missionaries ever came into the, the tribes of the Native Americans? Let's pray. Father God, Sometimes our minds can limit the work of God. And so today, Father, we come before you. We don't try and understand others. We just tell others of our faith and our story. And we should be open to others. But in all of that, let us see the common um, denominator of our faith, and that is in Christ Jesus. Whichever name he is called, Who's to say that you have not been there long before man had ever set foot? Well, Father, we thank you and praise you this day for this reading, this question, and this opportunity to learn more and more. Father, I pray for your wisdom on this second part of this question. And I think it's so much deeper than what we're going to get into today. In Jesus' name, we come together. And in his power and glory, we, we are strengthened by his word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if Dave and Mary would like to come up and do our reading. Zephaniah tells us to rejoice at the thought of going home. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else, and then to live like that was our true truth, even now, even here, it is a joy to go home. John the Baptist reminds us, however, that it takes choices to live in this joy. It doesn't just happen. We choose to make life a joy by how we love others, by how we 
serve and give and care for others by how we do the job we do and how we impact the world around us. We build joy as we build a home in this world and the next. We light these candles, the candle of hope and of peace and of joy, as a sign that we are on our way home. We walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. It is time to go home. My mom. One of our uh, plant managers that got transferred down to the Tennessee um, company that, that they own um, posted on Facebook. He um, drove through Mayfield and had some pictures on there. And he said that the pictures do not even, you know, give justice to the damage. Prayers for Jim and Sharon. Dick and Pat. Pardon me? Dick and Pat. Dick and Pat. All family. Family altar. Pray for our nation, elected officials, law enforcement, first responders, our armed forces, health care workers, caregivers, all those affected by COVID, all school teachers, workers, administration, students, all churches. All God's children. Um, as I said, I think um, to keep in mind, we just kind of mention all the time our first responders that, that in that situation with Pat and Dick, how important it was for that um, fireman um, to be right next door. And, and uh, they said they actually had two different ambulances kind of show up at the same time. Um, just um, in that situation, where Dick says, I'm not going anywhere. Pat had reinforcements. <laughs> I forget the paramedic, her name, what, but they both knew her. And she said, Dick, you're going to the hospital. And uh, so sometimes you just need that, that extra um, boost in, in, to get some stubborn man to go somewhere. So I want to keep in our prayers all the uh, schools and healthcare workers and um, the numbers. Uh, you might know uh, Chuck and Betty Green. Uh, Chuck is in the hospital, uh, went in yesterday. And uh, as far as I know, I don't know that he got a room yet, but he was sitting out in the hallway, uh, laying out in the hallway um, because they had no rooms, they were full. And uh, so the, the, our hospitals and, um, you know, they're just packed and, and with people. And so we want to continue to pray for um, all the doctors and nurses and all those in the healthcare facilities. So let's pray. Father God, you are you are a God in all of these situations. You bring um, healing and you bring joy and you bring struggles and in all of these things, Father, we know that your your guidance is what we need to uh, to to reach out for. Um, Father, we pray for healing, but for many families, there is not healing. And uh, that healing comes in knowing the promise of God, that there is a place, a kingdom, a place that has been prepared specifically for us. And that's the only hope, and that's the only peace that we can receive. And so, Father, today we come before you and we thank you for the, 
first responders that go into the homes and, and help bring this medical uh, uh, treatments long before we ever make it to a doctor or a nurse. We thank you for their, their willingness to do that. Father, we thank you for those who um, go out into these homes to help get those uh, patients into the, the vehicle, those who respond to the accidents and um, those who respond <clears throat> all night long in, in the tragedies through the tornadoes. Um, that traveled some 227 miles through four states. The devastation was great and the, and the people responded and, and worked diligently to help bring peace into the families of those who were um, tragically uh, lost their life or injured. Father, there is great destruction going on. And Father, we know that you are there in the midst of all that. And Father, we are so thankful that we can be here today and gather in your name to hear your word, to sing songs to your praise. In all of these things, Father, we thank you for that opportunity. But Father, there are people, as we talked about last week, who fear um, coming home. And Father, there's destruction, there is disease, there is illness, there is tragedy. There is all of these things in the homes of so many. So Father, today we come before you thanking you for the opportunity to be able to lift them up to you. Father, we know in our hearts that you can bring peace and joy, but we also know that that time of grief can run for so long. And so, Father, we just pray that your, your eyes, your ears can be um, cast upon these people so they can see the difficulty, but also know that there is, there is a time and that things will be better and to, to see the joy in knowing that Christ has prepared a place for us in, in your kingdom. And so Father, in all of this, we do live within our hearts here on earth, but Father, we want to expand so much greater, that to eternal life, that to know that we will never die. And so Father, we thank you for your son and the vision that he has given us of eternal life. We thank you for the blessing of knowing that God truly does care about the difficulty that we go through. In all of these things, Father, let us feel and hear the joy of our God. Father, as we come before you, we thank you and praise you for those who have sacrificed so much. Our military men and women, those overseas, those here at home, their families who are separated from their loved ones during this time of Christmas. In all of these things, we are very thankful and so, Father, today, as we come together in this body of Christ, whether we are gathered in our homes or here in the church, we lift our voice to you in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Our scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Zephaniah, and uh, we will be reading from chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. And uh, this is entitled in, the, in the, the Bible about a song of joy, but we're going to kind of look at it a little bit later in, in a different way than maybe you're kind of used to hearing this. So um, so let's hear the, the message for all of us in this song of joy as we hear these words from God. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, in, is in the, your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you over you with loud singing as on the day of the festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. 
I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. All that time I will bring you home. At the, at the time, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the words that we hear in Zephaniah. We thank you and praise you because our oppressors have been turned away. They have been conquered. Life is restored. We can come before our God. We thank you and praise you as we hear this song. Let us hear the words of God for us this morning. Let our lives be renewed. Let the brokenness be mended. And all that comes to us because you have given us your son. You have given us God. You have given us the message of joy this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's the third Sunday Advent, and we're kind of um, talking about uh, the, the message for all of us is that of joy. And uh, the first Sunday that we talked was that of hope. And I told the story of uh, time to come home and how my sister is gone for long periods of time. And then she comes home and, and it, 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 it's that time of hope. It's time of joy and uh, because she is coming home. And uh, the second Sunday was that of peace and the fear of home. We kind of talked a little bit about those who uh, fear uh, home, those who fear coming home. And it might be things of a uh, different thing, hatred, it might be... Uh, something going on in their life. It might be a disease. It might be um, a lot of different things. Addiction is one of the things that's kind of come to me um, through the last couple of weeks that, that the addiction of somebody in their family brings up fear of coming home or somebody being sick and, and uh, the fear of losing someone. And I really think that even, you know, today that fear of home can um, come very um, strong to those that um, we're in that path of the tornado. You take in, um, uh, the, the Amazon building and the, the lives that were lost in there, and the tragedy, um, the candle factory in Illinois, the, the 110 people were working there. And uh, I haven't heard how many, you know, lost their life or, you know, where that was at. But, you know, there, there's a fear of coming home because their loved one isn't there anymore. And so we talked about that last, last week and the, and the peace that we can find in coming home to God. And uh, this week is that of joy and uh, the joy of home. And so I've been kind of using my sister's visit, you know, and coming back, um, you know, as kind of like a, a story throughout this whole thing. So when I think of the that of joy, I think about, you know, when my sister does come home. Um, there's always, a, a, I'm very fortunate, all three of my kids, they live in the, in, in the neighborhood. I used to be able to say Lowell, but not anymore now it's cedar lake and lowell which isn't very far um, but i'm very fortunate because uh two of them have already built houses and one is building a house so i don't see them going anywhere anytime soon so so they're all close by but if you have children um, that kind of live some distance away uh, i'm not going to say that you don't see very often because my kids are pretty close and I don't see them very often. So it's just one of the things, the busyness of our uh, of the lives of our kids. And so in that, um, my kids don't come a long way, but there's great joy when they do come over and, and come to visit. And so when I think about Debbie, there's when she comes home, there's great joy in the home when she comes home. And But one of the things that, that always happens is when somebody comes is that they make this big, long to-do list. They make this list of things that they feel they have to do to, to make my sister feel happy. You know, we're gonna come back and we're, they used to sit down and do this, you know, they sit down and make this long list. We're gonna go here, we're gonna go there, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And you know, we're gonna go shopping. And in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, all you're gonna do is buy the things that'll be in a yard sale and then the next year, you know, but they sit there and think, well, these are the things I can't get at home, you know, and all that. And so they sit there and say, well, what day are you gonna take off work? And I said, what day are you not going to do the to-do list? That's the day I'm going to take off work. And so I don't, I don't want to do that. If you're going to go shopping, I'm not, I'm not taking a day off. I'll find you wherever you are at the end of my day. I don't, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't find joy in that. I don't want. To do it. But then there was this one time, 
They were sitting there, Debbie had come and they had came up with this, they wanted to go to Auburn, Indiana. You know what's in Auburn, Indiana? Is the Auburn Cord Duesenberg Car Museum, Automobile Museum. I said, oh yeah, I can take a day off by it. Because I can spend quality time with my sister while driving to Auburn, Indiana. It's a little bit of a drive, not too far. But I can spend quality time. So I can do that for my sister. Of course, part of that was about, I've always wanted to go to that museum. I've always wanted to see those cars. You know, they are absolutely beautiful. They're, they're, they're cars to, to behold. It's just, um, they're a works of art. And I just love going there. I love looking at the car. Although I did, it did come to my mind is that here, in, well, things have changed now. But in Northwest Indiana, man, that car had to be hard to drive in the wintertime. Man, them little skinny tires on there, no heat of any kind and all that kind of stuff. You have to tell me about it, John. So, and it's, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it, 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 I think that in the summer of August, it had to be hot as that, in that car. In the, in the wintertime, it had to be cold in that car. It had to be dry, hard to drive in the snow. And all that. But they were absolutely beautiful cars. I really enjoyed going there. And it, as a sidebar, yeah, I enjoyed spending time with my sister driving there and coming back. So there is a there is a kind of like a thing that I wanted for myself because I'd always wanted to go there, but also I was glad that somebody else wanted to go there. So um, so that was a joy, but I was not interested in being a part of that to do list. And so I'm very thankful now that my sister, when she comes home, she just says, you know what? I want to visit with people. I want to I want to visit with the family. I want to stay. I don't want to have to go anywhere. And I'm like, yes. That's all about that. That's the joy of home. That's the joy of coming home and spending time together. So in today's scripture, in Zephaniah, there, it's it's a joy. But I think there's something that we have to see in the words of, of Zephaniah in chapter three. It's a it's a song of joy, is how it's said. But I want you to kind of think about this: is that this is God singing the song to the people. See, we sit there too many times. We sit there and the book of Psalms is just full of songs. Psalm of, songs of David and all that kind of stuff. It's full of songs. And many songs are written off the scriptures over and over. But in here, this, this, song, this, this song that we're hearing here, this is God singing this song to the people of Jerusalem and Judah. Now, we did a Bible study. Now, it's been a, a while ago. But we did a Bible study. It's four or six weeks. I couldn't remember. But this... This passage kind of come to mind. I don't think we did it on this passage. But the Bible study was about what do the people of the Old Testament hear when we read the, the scripture. Now we know in that Isaiah, you know, we hear uh, in there in Isaiah all the time the, 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 the Christmas, you know, scripture out of Isaiah and the prophecy of the coming of Christ and, and all these kind of things. But but Christ wasn't in the world then. He was he was in the kingdom, but he wasn't in the world. So what did the people, that was our main focus, what did the people hear from the Old Testament readings? And so I think Zephaniah kind of comes into that, that way of thinking. That we need to understand why the Zephaniah, the prophet Zephaniah wrote this passage for the people of that day. Now Zephaniah is only three chapters long. And in the first chapter is kind of like, it's a, it's a chapter of, of, of judgment upon the people, judgment upon the people of Jerusalem and Judah. And so that's what they're kind of going through. It goes into uh, chapter 2 a little bit, but it, that's the judgment of the people of Judah and Jerusalem. That's who um, God is speaking to. So they're going through a rough time. And then in the second part of that, going into chapter 2, not into 3, but in chapter 2, it's talking about the, the nations that surround there. And what's happening in the world is there are people turning away from God. And, and the nations are kind of um, coming into themselves. They're thinking of themselves <clears throat> as not needing God. They're powerful enough that they can make it through whatever comes. And there, there is no humility at all. They're, 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 they're prideful people. And, they're, they, and this is the fall that is happening to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And so this is what is happening in the world. And, and so there is this, this tragic uh, difficult time for the people of Judah and Jerusalem and the surrounding nations that are all around there are very prideful people and so what we have in this passage here is that they have taken and removed themselves 
from that of their, their religion, their faith, and their belief in God. In other words, God has not become the, 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 the specific source of strength for the people of Judah. And there is this, this, this turning away from God. And so in, to, in chapter 3, in, a, in the first verse, 1 through 7, I think we kind of take this change where the people are coming back to God. How many times do we come back to God through the tragedies and the difficulties in our life? Sure, I think we continue to believe. We believe in God, but we don't depend on Him. We don't depend on Him like it, it is the way that we make it through each and every day. We don't depend on Him until something tragic happens in our life. Then all of a sudden, God becomes very important to us again. And that's what's happening in the beginning of chapter 3. That the people are kind of coming back to God. And they're singing praises to God. And they're coming back to Him in a way. And in, in verses 14 through 20, this is God singing along. This is the way I look at it. He's singing along with the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And I think the important part for us to look in there is what God is saying to the people. And he's saying, sing aloud. In other words, be joyful. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. And in other words, the people of God, the, the Israelites, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. He's telling them how to rejoice in coming back to him. But I also think that God is singing to the people, and he is rejoicing because they came back to him. I think that's important for us to understand. That when we wander, when we drift, we, we, uh, I love the, the, the call to worship and how um, the, the, Dr. Weber was uh, one that taught my last class. I love that guy. And I, but I love the, the vision he gave to us, winding through the ordinary. I think, isn't that the way your life is? Isn't that the way my life is? Is that everything becomes ordinary. I'm going to work. I'm coming home. Three hours later, I'm going to bed because I get up at 3 o'clock. It's, it's the ordinary. It's just winding through the ordinary. And then weaving through the busyness. See, I think winding is just kind of leisurely. I think weaving is you're going a little bit quicker. You want to get through all that busyness. And overcoming roadblocks and detours. We all have roadblocks and detours. I think in all of the busyness and all of the ordinary and all of the roadblocks and all that, I think we kind of depend on ourselves, much like the nations that surround Judah and Jerusalem. So we become more dependent on ourselves. And then something, some tragedy, some situation comes into our life, and all of a sudden we feel a need to come back to God. I don't think this is odd for any of I think it happens to all of us. We're not different than anyone else. It's just a part of who we are. It's a part of our life. And I think what, what we need to hear here is how God is rejoicing with the people of Jerusalem and Judah. And he's rejoicing with them and he's saying, sing aloud. Tell other people of the praises of your God. Tell others of the joy of your God. Tell others of the things that are happening in your life. Don't just keep it to yourself. Shout aloud. Then he goes on, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. In the first part, the people of Judah and Jerusalem were being judged. And their, thing, their, their world was falling apart. They were being judged against God. And all of a sudden, God says in here that I'm going to take away your judgments because of your, your, your coming back to me. I'm going to take all of that away from you. And I'm going to turn away your enemies. I'm going to make things... You know, enemies, I want you to kind of think of it. It's not just an enemy, a person, his body. Take away your enemies means take away everything that turns you away from God. Maybe it's the addiction that we talked about in the fear of home. Maybe it's tragedy in the home. Maybe it's, it's hatred in the home. Maybe it's a disagreement with a family member. Maybe it's a fear of coming back home because you have been gone so long and you're not sure how you're going to be received. I miss so many Christmases with my family. How are they going to receive me? I think our enemies is that which turns us away from God. And so when you say that, he says, I'm going to turn away your enemies because of your faithfulness to come back to me. And the king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. And in, in other words, in the very presence of the people of Judah and Jerusalem. 
that God has come to him in the midst of all that. And on that day, and we, we talked about all through this, and, and our whole major theme throughout all of this is coming home from Christmas. And our theme for that is coming back to God. Coming back into our relationship with God. Taking away the, the, the commercialism of Christmas and getting back to what it truly means, and that's coming back to Christ. We have the vision on Christmas of the baby Jesus here, but sometimes coming back to Christ means coming back to the God that we accepted at whatever time in our life. He who is fully God, he who has forgiven our sins, he who has went to the cross and died for you and I, that's the one we are coming back to. That's the one we're coming back to at this time of Christmas. And so God says in there, I will remove disaster from you. I will change their shame into praise. And at that time, in other words, the day of the Lord's coming again, I will bring you home at a time when I will gather you and I will make the renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth. God is going to restore the earth. He's going to restore humanity. He's going to restore our faith in him. Much like Judah and Jerusalem, through their own um, turning away from God, God is going to restore their faith in him. That's what's going on during the time of Zephaniah. That's what the people of Jerusalem and Judah are hearing. That's what the people of surrounding who have turned away from God, that's what they're hearing. But what about the Christian belief that when Christ has already come? What do we hear from the Scripture? The Scripture is read during the Christmas time, during Advent, during Easter, all of these things because of the things that we hear today. And it says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. In other words, all of God's people, shout aloud, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. In other words, Christ has come into the world, Jesus has died on the cross, and he has died for your sins. That's how we as Christians read this passage today. And then it goes on, the King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. God is here with us today. We say that when we come together and worship, the very presence of God through the power of the Holy Spirit is here and alive and amongst us. And we are to come back into our faith. We are to turn away from that which separates our God. And he will remove the enemies that, do, that put us in that way. And on that day, Jerusalem, on that day, Teth, on that day, people of God, on that day, Christians throughout the world, do not fear. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. What a vision. In the midst of all my darkness and difficulty and my turning away from God, in all of that, God himself is going to be a warrior and turn away our enemies, and he will be victorious. So have we turned away from God? It says later on in our passage, I will change their shame into praise. Those who were shamed, those who were turned away from the people, those who were thought of to be outcasts, it talks about a little bit later, all of those things, God says, I will change that into praise. And I will be your warrior, and we will be victorious. That's hope. That brings peace. And we can see the joy in the words of God. Can you see what it is for us today to hear this song of joy being sung to us by God? I'm going to read it one more time for you today. But I want you to hear it as God himself singing this song to you. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, 
Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies, the King of Israel. The Lord is in your midst, and you shall, you shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on that day of the festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. I will save the lame. I gather the outcasts. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. At the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth, I will restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. It is God himself that gives us these words. Today is the Christian, he who has received Christ Jesus. We hear something different than the peace than what the people of Ze the, the prophet Zephaniah was telling the people of Judah and Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, surrounding nations. But the message is still the same for all of us: that God is in our midst. Let us shout our praises to our God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this message today. Father, we thank you for the hope and that the, the people of uh, Israel and Judah must have heard in this song. We know that in the verses prior to that, that they were singing songs of praise. But in this part that we hear today, God himself was singing this song of praise to the people. And so, Father, you are our, our warrior. You are what gets us through, and you are that hope and that peace that comes in, in, in that victory that we will receive within you. And so, Father, today, let our hearts be uh, brought together as one in this body of Christ as we feel the very presence of our God here with us today. We are people who are trying to return home this Christmas. So, Father, if we have separated ourselves for one reason or another, if that enemy seems too great for us today, let us find the hope in the one who is here with us today and who will reign victorious. And he will remove our oppressor. He will remove our, our oppressions. He will remove all that separates us from you. And we will stand in his presence feeling fully redeemed through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's all join together in our closing hymn, 246, Joy to the World.
I was thinking on the way out of here is that I, my mom is, is just so much into the, the moon, you know, and the, the moon is up and it's a, it could be a sliver, it could be a full moon, it could be whatever, and she just got to run outside and look at the moon because she says that she knows that her sister in, in uh, Southern Illinois is looking at the same moon. So they talk to each other and they think it's ridiculous. And so, <laughs> but if it works for them, it's all good. And so, but I was sitting there thinking about the, the sunrise this morning. Now I do like the sunrise. And, but one of the things about the sunrise that I kind of see is that the majority of my time in seeing a sunrise, because I get to work, it's dark, I come home, it's dark. And so the majority of my sunrise and sunset is obscured by the branches of a tree, because it's usually when I'm sitting in a tree stand that I'm able to watch that. And so today I was coming out here and I just saw the sun coming up. And the pictures that I took of watching the sun was always through the trees. And because I just like that vision of that coming through there. And so, but in, in sunrise, it, it, for me, it just, majority of the time, I, it's always obscured by something. Even if it's up on straight above me, it, it, I'm looking through the trees, I just never see that kind of full thing. At least that's my vision kind of thing. And so I just kind of thought, that that's kind of how life is, is that there's something out there, something so beautiful, but there's, there's things in our life that just kind of block the full vision of that. And so I think sometimes for all of us is that seeing God truly at work in our life is, a, is kind of blocked by all the different obscurities and difficulty and oppression and all that in, in our life. So we have to just kind of focus beyond those branches and those twigs and that which blocks out part of the sun in our life, meaning S-O-N. And so let us look beyond that as people of God. And let us see that, that Christ himself has truly freed us of all oppression and all those times that we've kind of separated ourselves from him. To God be the glory. May we go out into the world and shout, O, Pete, o daughter of Zion, that the King of kings, the Lord of lords, is here in our midst. Amen. <laughs> Christ be